Nice. It's my, my absolute pleasure to announce the, the final keynote of, uh, of today. This day went by really fast for me. I hope the same for you. Um, the, the origin of this keynote is actually back in, back in 2019. Uh, there was this really nice social network. Um, and on this social network, I saw a message from Wukash. And Wukash is one of the core maintainers of, uh, of Python. He offered a couple of peps that you're probably familiar with. And it was, it was this picture. And this is a picture of the, of the Night Watch. Probably most of you will recognize it. Everyone that's from Amsterdam will for sure recognize it. And it basically said, there's this camera with this giant rig at the Rijksmuseum on the Night Watch. And there's a laptop in front that's running, like, it's running Python. It's a Jupyter Notebook. And there's Matplotlib on this. And lo and behold, the first reaction was, was Rob. And, oh, that's me. Yeah, this is Jupyter and AsyncIO, and there's a red button that, that quits the entire thing if something breaks. And I just thought, like, the stars have aligned. This is the PyData Amsterdam keynote for next time we have an in-person event. So it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Rob Erdman, full professor at the UVA, scientist at the Rijksmuseum. Please give him a large round of applause. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, thanks for the, the invitation. I'm really excited to, to finally uh, be back among the nerds again. Um, yeah, so that tweet ended up um, resulting in um, uh, Guido van Rossum um, talking about how heartwarming it was to see that his um, async IO uh, was being used for something so, um, so momentous as the Night Watch. And then I got an invitation to be a keynote speaker at the PyCon conference which then didn't happen because of COVID. And then a year passed and I, uh, I was able to give a, a keynote about the imaging of the Night Watch, but um, the conference was online only. So this is my first opportunity to be back among um, Python developers. I'm not gonna talk about that though. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll talk about the results of it. Um, but um, rather, I hope during the next uh, 50 minutes or so to, to give you a sense uh, I guess 45 minutes, to give you a sense of the kinds of um, really interesting work on computation and imaging uh, that I get to do as senior scientist in the Rijksmuseum. Um, I'm also a professor at the University of Amsterdam, split between um, physics and the Faculty of Science and conservation and restoration. Um, so broadly, I define my mission as to help the world access, preserve, and understand its cultural heritage. Um, and when I first uh, came to the Rijksmuseum, I was a fluid mechanics guy, my PhD is in material science, so I was really not a cultural heritage um, person so far. So when I came to the field, I recognized that there are certain things that we could use from high performance computing and so on to help the field, um, and I made a 10 year plan in 2014. So I'm on year nine of the 10 year plan to try to build the things that I think the field needs. Um, so this is a slide from my, my PyCon talk in uh, 2021 that shows um, the absurd lengths that I had to go to to image the Night Watch, which again is uh, it's Rembrandt's largest painting. Um, and it's, uh, the, the Rijksmuseum is actually designed as a kind of cathedral around, um, around the Night Watch. It's at the center of the Gallery of Honor and so on. Um, so I'll just uh, show you the kinds of things um, that I had to deal with to take a picture and that's, that's um, uh, to take a really, really, really big picture. So this is the Night Watch in the Rijksmuseum, and you can see there's a big glass box around it. And the reason for this is that about a quarter uh, to half of the people who go to the Rijksmuseum come explicitly to see the Night Watch. So if we're going to do a research project and a, a, a restoration project for the painting called Operation Night Watch, we can't take it off display and put it in the lab and go work on it. We have to do everything in front of the public. So that's a huge challenge. Um, so uh, to do that, um, the first stage was a research project in which we had to basically collect all of the data we possibly could about the painting, and that includes an incredibly high resolution um, photo. So we had to uh, design and program a five axis robot that can move left, right, up, down, front, back, and to rotate around the painting, uh, because we want to take a picture that's uh, five micrometer resolution. 
And what that means is if you move one pixel to the right in your image, you're moving five micrometers to the right in the image, and a human red blood cell has a diameter of eight micrometers. So one of our pixels will happily fit inside a human red blood cell. So we have a robot, and we mount uh, the world's highest resolution camera on this thing that can move around in front of the painting. Uh, we have um, lasers and flash units and all kinds of things to measure distances. Um, and then to take a huge picture like this, you first have to know what the true shape of the painting is. So this involves um, taking, standing really far back and taking, the whole, uh, taking a picture where the whole painting is in the field of view. Then you um, uh, measure the actual distances between all of the corners, every pairwise distance and the diagonal distances. And then you can use um, uh, scikit-learn um, to basically optimize a model to um, uh, distort the image so that it's as uh, true to correct scale as possible. Um, then we had uh, laser rangefinders, and I drove around for four days in front of the painting with laser rangefinders to get a, a ground truth 3D model of the, the picture. Um, so the night watch is not flat. Um, it's basically got a belly. It's a big painting. It weighs 300 kilograms. So uh, you can imagine that the, the weight of the paint actually causes the whole thing to sag, and it's been stretched, so it has ripples. And my camera only has a... a, a one eighth of a millimeter depth of field, meaning the region in space in front of the camera that will be really, really sharp is only one eighth of a millimeter thick. So if the painting is like this and my camera is like this, then the overlap between what is sharp and where the painting is is only a little strip. So I need to position my camera perfectly so that everything is sharp. Um, so there was lots of calibration. Um, scikit learn stuff, real time fitting, then there was a whole bunch of stuff with color, uh, color calibration. You take a picture of uh, a target that has 140 patches with a known color, very, very precisely measured color, and then um, you know what the truth was of those colors, and then you know what you saw on your camera, so you can basically build a machine learning model to transfer what the camera sees into the truth of what it should see, because why are we capturing the Night Watch at five micrometer resolution? Because it's the most important painting in the Rijksmuseum. And sometimes bad things happen. Notre Dame burns down, or there are terrorist attacks, or there are wars. Bad things happen. So the act of documenting our cultural heritage is one of the most important things. Plus, it's going to be used for deciding how we're going to treat the painting. So, um, bespoke models were made for color management to correct the colors from what we saw to what they should be. Um, then you have this um, absurdly complicated capture system that basically requires that I have um, up here uh, a Raspberry Pi that's got a microcontroller that knows how to drive the camera all over the place, plus it has accelerometers because I want to wait till the camera is not bouncing around to take a picture. It has temperature and relative humidity because things change their shape and size when things get moist and when things get hot. Um, I have a laptop that rides around with the camera and I need to tell the camera to take a picture, but the camera at this, at this time um, it doesn't have an API, so I had to make a screen reader that could simulate typing on the buttons and, you know, typing file names and so on. Um, and then as soon as I take a picture, I had to do um, uh, real-time quality checking with a neural network that would see whether the photo I had just taken was appropriately lit, whether it was sharp, whether it had motion blur, all of this kind of stuff. So um, I have to take 8,439 photos. <laughs> driving this camera all over the place. And if I take a bad photo, I'll be really sad later after I tear everything down and I find that one of the photos is bad. So there's real-time um, neural network uh, 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 binary classification, uh, yay or nay, um, on the laptop. Um, and then there is an async I.O. Jupyter interface. So I can sit in a Jupyter notebook that has um, IPy widgets running connected to the robot in real time while I'm sitting there typing away in cells. So all of these buttons that you see here, this is just a Jupyter notebook that has IPy widgets running in one of my cells. 
real time because whenever you're in Jupiter, you actually have the async IO loop already running. So you can just throw things in there and, and they'll work and you can sit there and do your computations that you would normally be doing interactively while it's constantly doing web sockets talking to the back end to make sure that the robot is happy. <clears throat> um, yeah, so then you, you collect um, lots and lots of data. Um, I was inspired to get into computer graphics because I loved Lightbright as a child, so this, this meme really struck it for me. Um, we're making a, an image that's going to be 717 gigapixels. So you collect seven terabytes of data, image data, and then you have to stitch them all together, so how does that work? Um, here is a little zoom in of the main figure. Um, each one of these is a 100 megapixel photo. So I have to stitch these all together um, so that there's no evidence that this came from a camera with a painting that's moving because it's a 17.2 square meter sail. There's air currents in the Rijksmuseum and so the painting moves back and forth very, very slowly and I have an eighth of a millimeter window that I have to capture correctly. Um, so there's one of my photos. So I take that overview photo that I collected at the beginning where I stood way back and took a picture of the whole thing and then I have to uh, register my little photo onto that so I know where it sits. That involves a neural network that learns how to filter images regardless of their source or their resolution so that I can find uh, precisely the one offset that would make them line up perfectly. Um, then I measure that offset field across the images. Then I model it, again, scikit-learn uh, with a robust estimator to figure out exactly what kind of perspective effects and so on I need. Um, and then uh, down the rabbit hole, do this at more resolutions. And then ultimately I, I have an idea of where I should put each of these 8,439 100 megapixel photos, but I need to do it really fast so then Jax comes in. Um, which ultimately lets you write really simple code. So like here's the code for an in interpolation kernel and here's the code to apply a ter the interpolation kernel to figure out the color. So this is um, seven by seven querying. If I, I need to know what color it is someplace where I didn't measure a, a, a pixel, then I'm looking at a seven by seven neighborhood to figure out what the color function looks like so that I can do a really, really, really good job of interpolation where I want to know the, the image. Uh, color. Um, so with Jax, you can just write that with uh, querying to one point, and then you can say, hey, why don't you just map this across all of the axes so that I'm going to query at 100 million points. And ultimately, you can do that so that your, your interpolation function runs in 44 milliseconds for 100 million pixels. That's important. Um, because you've got a lot of pixels. Um, so pandas is involved behind the scenes to keep track of all the metadata and where things go and uh, their file names and everything else. And then there's a bunch of graph theory um, to figure out how to stitch this together without going, okay, I have no images, I put one down. Okay, and now I have another image, and now I make a stitch with two images. Okay, now I have another one, and I make a stitch with three images. You can't do that because then it would take till the end of the world. So instead you, you make a, a color partition of the overlap graph of all of the images into four, in this case four colors. So I have four um, non-overlapping sets that look like this. Um, so within any given set none of the images overlap, but if I can figure out how to fuse together these four images then I will have one fusion of the whole thing. But then the quality of the pixels at the edge of an image are lower than the quality of the pixels at the center of the image because then you have lens distortion because you're probing the sides of the lens, you have um, color uh, aberrations, you have vignetting. So I need to fuse together the data in a way that weights the pixels at the center more heavily than the pixels at the edge. So that means I have to do uh, solve a Poisson equation and so I use the pi uh, AMG algebraic multigrid solver to solve the Poisson equation for the pixel weighting at each pixel. Um, then they get fused together, and then I'm using scale space, which is a beautiful area of mathematics that basically says that an image like this one here on the left can be decomposed as, uh, if you blur it a little bit, you get this one, but then what did you take away? The difference is these, this thing down here. So this represents only the smallest features, the larger features, the larger features, the larger features, and the largest features. 
So I can basically do surgery on an image, and I blend the small features together at a small scale, blend the medium features together at a medium scale, blend the large features together at a large scale, and that means that any variations that I might have because my left light was always brighter than my right light by 4% or something, when I'm going from one image to the one next to it to the one next to it, those broad lighting gradients get blurred away. In the end, um, these are pixel coordinates um, down here. So it's basically a million pixels wide, 717,000 pixels tall. Great. So uh, that was the talk I gave at PyCon uh, 2021. So now I'm going to tell you about what kinds of things we can do with an image like that. Um, so I'll show you some examples to begin with. So here it is. Um, and down at the lower right corner, I'm going to put in a scale bar. So the actual painting is four and a half meters wide and 3.7 meters tall, okay? So let's zoom into something that I know is beautiful. So here we are, um, that's 500 micrometers, so that's half a millimeter over there. I'm now able to see every single pigment particle um, and in fact, I can measure the, the diameter of this here. Um, that's only 1.3 millimeters wide. So I can now see the paint before that Rembrandt thought he had mixed completely on his palette. I can see the three streaks of paint. Um, I can see a smalt particle, which is a little, it's a kind of pigment that's made of cobalt that's uh, ground up, cobalt glass that's ground up. Um, and so I can see the fragmentation pa pattern of the, of the cobalt. Um, if I zoom into um, what is uh, often um, thought to be a Rembrandt self-portrait, this guy here wearing the beret peeking between the two, um, then I, I get to study um, what um, is sometimes called the mystery of mastery. How does Rembrandt know that if he does three little strokes of paint like this, that when I zoom out to here, it will look like a highlight on his eye? So, so is this just like the cult of resolution that I like really like pixels? Um, I do really like pixels, but um, here you can see the kinds of things that we would be interested in from a conservation standpoint. This is what's called a lead soap. Lead soap happens when you, um, when you have um, lead that's in, for example, the oil paint or the ground layer behind the painting. Um, uh, lead white is a, is a paint that's often used in, in these times. That reacts with uh, potassium, it undergoes a saponification reaction, and it makes a little, little particle, which over uh, hundreds of years gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it pokes its head on, on the surface of the, of the pa uh, painting like a pimple. And then, so here's one that's poked its head out, and then later it will fall out, leaving behind a crater that then fills with dirt, and this discolors the appearance of the painting. Um, the other kinds of stuff I can do here, um, I can see evidence of the, of the past conservation treatments. So here's the, the only woman uh, in the whole painting, uh, famously, and if I zoom all the way in here, again, there's 250 micrometers uh, scale bar. Um, I can see a place where in 1975 uh, or 76, a restorer made a tiny little one millimeter wide dab of paint to cover up this blemish on her face. And back here, you probably don't see it, but it's there, we can see it. Um, other uh, cool things we can do, for example, um, since I have this neural network uh, image registration system, I can show you a photo of the uh, damage from the slashing attack. In 1975, a madman um, came up with a knife and started slashing at the, at the main figure um, and some other figures. Um, and I can also show you a manganese map, which is obtained from uh, procedure called macro x-ray fluorescence, where we basically shoot x-rays at a painting, we measure the x-rays that come off, the so-called fluorescent x-rays, we, we measure their energies, and we can map the elements across the whole painting. So here you have the five micrometer uh, resolution uh, image, you have a photo from 1975 where it was uh, slashed, and you have the map of the manganese, which is indicative of a pigment called umber, and the restorers used umber to, to repair the painting, but Rembrandt did not use umber, so when I see manganese, I know, aha, that's not Rembrandt. Also, you can see up here that there is a little uh, a kind of cartouche that has the names of the sitters. Rembrandt didn't paint that. Um, and you can further see that someone made a boo-boo. Um, 
And so there's a kind of TPEX correction that I can see over there. Um, we don't only work with paintings. So here's a beautiful object that was just purchased by the Rijksmuseum with a very generous donation. Um, this is a, a kind of glass called kunkel glass. Um, so this was um, photographed completely by robots. So here you have um, 500 photos. Um, so I basically bought an IKEA turntable and hooked up a stepper motor to it and then put a fast API uh, interface on it in Python. Um, and I also have the ability to control a, a camera from Python. So I can put the object on the turntable, take a picture, turn it one five hundredth of a turn, take a picture, and so on. Um, but then the problem with an object like this is that it's, um, it has no center. It's totally lopsided, so if you put it on the turntable and you take pictures, then it goes like this. So this also has, behind the scenes, um, uh, from, from Meta, they've released something called the Segment Anything model, SAM. Um, so this is using the Segment Anything model to seg segment the foreground from the background, and then to basically correct it so that the, the, the only symmetric part on the object, which is the stem, stays perfectly centered. On a cell phone, if you come to me afterwards, it's cool because I hooked up the tilt sensor, so it's like a virtual object. You can tilt your phone and you can see different sides of it. Um, sometimes, what you want is a display in which uh, you need more frames than you took. But you can't just average between your frames because then everything would become blurry. So this is uh, using something called frame interpolation. So basically, if I have, uh, let's say, 360 photos, one degree separated, then I can teach a neural network how to um, infer missing photos. So I can say, ah, well, I pretend that I only have 180 photos, and I ask you to guess the even-numbered ones, and I know the answer, so I teach you how to, how to guess what those are. And then I keep uh, subdividing. So I have 360 photos, I ask it to guess the ones that would have been at the half-degree increments, and now I have 720 photos. I repeat that, I have 1,400, and so on, uh, down the rabbit hole. Um, so this is 3,000 photos coming from only 500. Um, so that I can play it back just butter smooth on, on a website, for example. Um, we can also do cool things because of this registration and the ability to automatically move a turntable. Um, here is an object from the Hollandia shipwreck. Um, the Rijksmuseum is the uh, Dutch National Museum of Art and History, so we have a lot of history objects. Um, and so this is the same kind of thing, but also I have the ability to move a light. Um, I should also say that 100% of what I'm showing you here is running in, in my web browser. So none of this is logo, this is just a web browser. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So this then gives us the ability to use our, our um, human perceptual um, psychology. We have incredible ability to infer the shapes of things by looking at how the shading changes when, when, they, uh, when the angle changes. So even though I don't have a 3D model that I'm showing you here, this is just photos, um, the fact that I'm able to smoothly blend between photos where the light was at different positions means that you probably have a really excellent idea of what shape this thing is with these beautiful scroll engravings and so on. Um, so uh, more traditional neural network stuff. Um, that's a silver object, and in the 17th century, if you were a, a, a master a silver maker, when you made a piece of silver, you would stamp your maker's mark on it, and then it would go to the guild, and they would assay it to make sure it was you know, really 14 karat gold, that kind of stuff. Um, they would make sure it was the right uh, uh, grade of silver, and they would, uh, um, they would put their own stamp on it that says what year it was assayed, and so on. So this is a little... Um, uh, neural network in which I can upload an image. In this case, I just have it on my, um, on my hard drive, but you could do this with a cell phone. You upload an image, and then through a fast API and then a PyTorch uh, neural network that's running inside the fast API backend here, um, I can basically bring up uh, an estimate of which maker's mark or tax mark or whatever this is. So in this case, it thinks it's a maker's mark from Jonas uh, Gucci, um, and it's super duper confident that that's the right answer. And it also shows you examples of that maker's mark. So it doesn't just tell you the answer, it basically gives an expert the ability to assess what they think is a good idea. Um, uh, moving on now to a, a beautiful uh, drawing by Rembrandt. This is only 14 centimeters tall. Uh, people think that it's probably of his wife, although his wife Saskia 
who died the year the, rent, the Night Watch was finished, uh, was too high class to ever dress like a peasant like this. But um, still, um, what I've done here is taken raking light photos. So that's basically you have a flashlight or a torch, um, and you shine it at different angles across the surface. So I've basically fused those together and then um, used machine learning to assess how much of what we see here is due to the color of the paper and how much it is due to the shading, to, to the, uh, the surface topology of the paper. And now what I can do is have a virtual light source that's attached to the mouse that I can now move the mouse around in front of this drawing and show you what it would look like if it had no color. So this is basically, if it were made of chalk, what would it look like? And you can see that, that now I can see beautiful details. Like I can see that uh, Rembrandt apparently used a different pen here for these scribbles. I can see the chain lines and the laid lines from the mold. I can see where it's had conservation treatments. I can see how the ink has caused, at this big stroke that you see here, how the ink has caused the paper to pucker up because of the hydrogen bonds between the paper fibers. I really get a sense of how Rembrandt drew this thing. I can almost reconstruct the stroke order. We're not there yet, but... Um, by using physically-based rendering, um, this is work with a PhD student of mine, uh, Alessandra Marocchesi, we, um, we can basically simulate the process of lighting this object with raking light, and then we can ask, well, what elevation of the paper would make the photos that we actually saw? You know, like, so I can simulate where the lights were, where the camera was, and then I can use um, differential programming, differentiable uh, programming, rather, um, to basically figure out what elevation of the paper would have when photographed in the way that I photographed it with all these raking lights, given me the photos that I took. So that, that then really lets you see where the paper is. So light color is uh, close to us, dark color is far away from us. Um, now, uh, one of my favorite examples here is, okay, you've got to work on paper, and the work on paper has um, a watermark in it, and that will tell you who made the, who made the paper. Um, so great, hold it up to the light, and then what you see is all of the ink, because it's a piece of paper in the museum, so it's got something really great on the front and often on the back. So I want to see the watermark, what do I do? Uh, well, you, you train a neural network to remove the ink. Um, <clears throat> So here is another little fast API server where I can drag and drop images into it. Um, and then it, um, it uses a synthetic data set that I use physics to simulate how, how it looks when ink gets added to paper. I basically take that and I reverse it uh, to make it as a training set for a convolutional neural network. So this goes in and this, uh, this comes out. So this goes in, it takes away all of the ink. So that goes in, takes away all of the ink. This comes out, and now you can read the watermark. This goes in, this comes out, now you can read the watermark. So then we can identify who, who made this, where was the paper made, and uh, can, we, can we then say something interesting about the artwork. Um, let's see, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Um, here is um, beautiful five micrometer imaging um, that our photographer Karola van Dijk and I uh, collected. Uh, same kind of thing. Uh, but here we didn't have a robot that could tilt because the robot that can tilt is still in front of the night watch. Um, so if you would go here, you can see that some places, this, this one shouldn't be sharp, but as an example, this one's not sharp, so we can use um, a super resolution uh, style um, uh, transformer network to basically um, infer what it would have looked like if it were sharp. So this goes in, this comes out, and suddenly you can see these details. Um, when we collect macro X-ray fluorescence data, we usually get something like this in the middle. So this is phosphorus map, and you can see that it's really, it's really spotty. This is a low concentration element that's very difficult to detect. But there is something that images are like. This is not a pointillist painting. This, is a, this has brush strokes. So knowing that it has brush strokes, then based upon what I sense, I can figure out what the, what the probably correct distribution of phosphorus is. So this is a neural network that takes this very, very noisy data and effectively denoises it under a Poisson data model to tell us what it would have looked like over here. Um, we all don't just collect the data, we can also do cool things to analyze it. So this is Martin and Opian. And this is a pair of uh, portraits that were purchased for um, 80 million euros each. <coughs> Um, by the French and Dutch governments. They now uh, hang in the Rijksmuseum and they will hang in the Louvre, Rijksmuseum Louvre alternating every eight years from now until eternity under a, a, a treaty agreement. 
These are the only full-length portraits, portraits that Rembrandt painted. So um, if you would take an X-ray of this, you would see that it's painted on canvas. And mostly what you see in an X-ray of a painting is where is the lead white, where are the heavy elements in the paint. But you can also see very, very, very faintly the imprint of the canvas. So it's, you know, it's a woven texture. So if I can suppress everything else and just show you the canvas, then if I can make a map of the spacing between the threads, then the spacing between the threads is a unique fingerprint of that one roll of canvas. So if you know, look at your jeans and you'll see that there's a dark fiber, there's a white fi light fiber. That's only, there's only one piece of cloth in the whole world that has that pattern. So when I detect that, I can tell that they were cut from the same roll of canvas. So if there was any question about whether these two really belonged together, uh, no, no question. I can also look at the angle of the, uh, of the threads in the canvas and I can see evidence for how they were originally stretched when they were being prepared. So I can see that they used to be stitched together before they were, before they were uh, separate. Um, now moving to something uh, bigger, M zooming out. Uh, this is now a bit stale, this is from 2016, but um, I was really excited uh, when ResNets came out and so on. Um, it seemed like the final, um, the, the penultimate layer before the classification head on a neural network would be feature uh, rich at a high semantic level. So what I did was I took every one of the 177,000 works on paper in the Rijksmuseum, I ran them through this neural network, asked the neural network to give me a feature vector that's uh, I think 2048 dimensions here, and then I used TSNI as well as my own algorithm to squeeze the results of a TSNI clustering into a rectangle. Um, to show every single work on paper with no metadata where the network has put things that it thinks are semantically similar near each other. So, for example, if I zoom in, you can see it's decided to put all of Rembrandt's etchings, yeah, it's full resolution, uh, together in one place. I can see that um, all of the, you know, farm animals are all together. I can see up here that there's you know, lots of scenes with bridges and architecture and, and so on. So this is, this is 177,000 works in one place because the thing is that a lot of people go to the museum website, they don't know what they're looking for. They just, you know, like a Vermeer um, and Rembrandt, but like how do I know all the cool things that are in the Rijksmuseum? Well, this shows you all of them. Um, um, uh, finally, um, coming to the final stretch now, um, there is a, a paper that's um, sort of the basis of all of this, you know, stable diffusion, generative AI kind of stuff called CLIP, Contrastive um, Learning, um, uh, uh, sorry, Contrastive Language Image Pre-Training. And the super cool thing that people don't really talk about is that what this, um, this CLIP network is all about is a joint embedding, and that joint embedding means um, that um, I have a bunch of images that have, um, to train it, I have a bunch of images that have captions. So they basically sucked up, you know, uh, 400 million images from the internet with captions, with, you know, like the alt text and wherever you could find a caption. Um, and um, the network knows how to associate images with captions. And the way that it does this, the super cool thing about this, is that there is one embedding space, one latent space, where it has two doors. You can come in with an image, you bring an image and it gives you a 1536 dimensional vector that's a feature vector that's a place in this latent space. Or you come with some English text and it puts you in the same space. So this means that now uh, you have a way of comparing images and text. So what I did was I took 2.3 open access, 2.3 million open access images. Um, I ran them each through this um, network. So I have 2.3 million points here and then I built a search engine. Um, that lets me uh, type what I'm looking for, like a woman wearing, sorry, uh, blue holding a musical instrument. Oops, sorry. And instantly get a result, um, a colorful staircase. And you can query at points that are off the, the space of images. So, for example, um, a medieval uh, laptop. <laughs> or a medieval 
airplane. You can also do amazing things with this. For example, a Blanchard, a Blanchard painting of Paris. Blanchard was, a, was an impressionist, oops, of Paris, uh, was an impressionist painter who painted lots and lots and lots of images of, of Paris. So what I can do is say, okay, that's nice, but I want to also query by image, so I'll copy the image address. So I'll just put in a URL and it will look up the image and find similarities that way. Okay, so there's a bunch of images that it thinks are semantically uh, relevant to this. But then I can also say, all right, that's nice, that's nice, but I want to move in this high dimensional semantic space in the snow direction. So I'm starting at an image and I want to lean in some direction that's uh, given by language. So let's move in this snow direction and see what's nearby. Or how about I move in the um, warm, glowing cafe lights direction. And now I find images that start here in the space and that then drift in the warm, glowing cafe lights direction. Um, so I will finish up um, with what I think is the most fun demonstration. I'm going to skip some things because of time. but um, So this is all great, but um, I want something where I can walk around in a museum and point my phone at something and have it tell me what, what I'm looking at and show me other things in other museums. So um, this, is a, this is a new app that I'm working on that I call Serendipity. And what I'm going to do here is I have a webcam and I have an art history book, The Story of Art. So I'm going to point the webcam at this. Um, all Python uh, backed with fast API. So um, whatever I point the webcam at, it's searching four times per second. So if I'm going to you know, point it at this uh, <laughs> bearded old bastard or plants, or how about I point it at an art history book? So this is showing the top 24 most similar results in this database of 2.3 million open access images four times a second remotely. And it works just as well on your cell phone, but a cell phone doesn't do well with the projector. <laughs> so um, with that, um, I guess I will, I will leave it there and say that the big picture is that we can really um, find a huge number of incredibly cool, incredibly hard problems in the museum, and um, it has big impact because if we succeed, then we can help the world access, preserve, and understand its cultural heritage. Thank you. <laughs>